Good evening. My name is Kathy Phillips, and I'd like to welcome you to our Bridge Builders Women's Ministry event on His Shoes. For those of you that have attended our fall event in the past, you may recall in her shoes, that event was designed for us to learn about how it feels to be someone else. How does the lonely widow feel? The isolated stay-at-home mother? The guilt-ridden working mom? How does it feel to be divorced and attending church with seemingly happy families? How does it feel to be single in a very coupled world? How does a woman who lost a child cope? The aim was to promote compassion and understanding for one another by realizing that we have no idea what other people are going through or have gone through. Using this lens, we would be a church family supporting one another rather than judging or tearing down. And even though the Beach Lake Free Methodist Church family is known for its love and caring of one another, we, like all sinners, can sometimes slip. As I prayed about it, I felt that God was gently nudging me in a different direction this time. I discussed this with some Christian sisters and received sound advice as I continued to pray. My prayer was answered when God planted in my mind and heart that this event would be less about what others are going through and more about how he leads us through. So I thought to myself, how does God lead us through? As I was contemplating this, I suddenly remembered something that I used to love to do with my own dad when I was a child. I used to dance on top of my father's feet. As I was thinking about that, I felt that God was saying to me, yes, Kathy, I want to lead you just like that. You see, when I danced on top of my father's shoes, I felt loved, safe, and secure. I was content to hang on tight and let my dad lead me wherever he thought best. I could feel my dad's love for me as he held me in his arms. And isn't that exactly what our Heavenly Father longs for us to do with him? He longs for us to let him take the lead. He wants us to feel nothing but loved and safe and secure. He wants us to climb up on his shoes daily, displaying a childlike trust that we, we may have long forgotten. I began thinking about how we would show that kind of love to our Heavenly Father this evening. Tonight, we will focus on three ways to show God our love for him. The first way is through praise. Jesus made it clear that we are not meant to walk through life on our own, evidenced by the fact that he came to earth to walk with us. Just as he walked with us, we are to walk alongside one another. We are to share our joys and sorrows with our fellow believers and more importantly, with him. After the resurrection, the early church was based on a communal example of living, working, and sharing in all things, and that included praise. The Lord was revered through both private and corporate prayer, through song and dance, and through good works. Tonight, we will praise our Heavenly Father by meditating on his scripture, by praying to him and for one another, and in song. I can't help but think that when we lift our hands and voices as one, that he will be pleased. The second way we will show our love for the Lord is through worship. God's intention is for us to worship him in all things and at all times. We are to worship privately, but also corporately. We are to attend church and to have fellowship with one another. We are to meet in one another's homes and break bread. When we sing songs of praise and worship and pray with one another, we experience a higher level of intimacy 
as we experience God's present, presence not only in our own lives, but in the lives of other believers. Finally, some of us will show their love for the Father by sharing their personal testimonies. Testimony is defined as a public profession of a religious experience. In the past few weeks, God has been imprinting on my heart and mind the power of testimony as a means of discipleship. Testimony is less about do what I say and more about this has been my experience. It always points to the Father and how he is working in people's lives. It is my joy to have you listen to the stories of three women that have firmly planted in their hearts that they want to be disciples who make disciples as they intimately share about a time in their lives that God clearly showed up to lead them as only he can in his perfect way and in his perfect timing. I pray that tonight will be a blessing to you as it has been to me. Will you let him lead you? And now Lori Glossinger will open us in prayer. Lord, we just thank you and we praise you for this glorious night. Lord, we just ask that your Holy Spirit just fills every single nook in this room but mostly that you're filling each and every heart. Father, we thank you and we praise you that you lead us through our lives. And Lord, that as we leave here tonight, that we leave changed, that we leave with a fire, as it says in Hebrews, like a fire, Father in our hearts, that we can share our testimony with so many of what you're doing, that we will not be ashamed, but we will be excited. We thank you, Father, for your faithfulness. We thank you, Father, for your glory and your mercy. We thank you, Father, for the women that are going to come up here and share what you have done in their lives. Father, we anticipate change we anticipate your leading, and we just praise you for this glorious night. Let our hearts be open and ready. And Father, we are so ready. We are so ready. And we just pray in Jesus' name, amen. Good evening, ladies. We're going to invite you to stand and worship with us if you're able and if you're comfortable standing. Um, we're going to sing a few songs this evening together and just praise the Lord together as we unite our voices together corporately as one and uh, just give great praise to God the Father. So let's join together as we sing. Kat's going to lead us in this first one, Good, Good Father. me 
Her, his women's voices lifted in praise together, and it is just so beautiful. I don't know if you can hear all of you there, but this up here, just all of you, it's amazing. <laughs> and I'm just praising the Lord, and what a wonderful thing it is, right? <clears throat> what a beautiful and glorious thing it is to lift our songs to the Lord. And He has done such amazing things for us, and I know we're going to hear a lot of those incredible stories tonight that are just going to be moving us probably to tears and an emotional roller coaster and um, I just the next song we're going to sing is called uh, called God I look to you and uh, it's a very simple song there's a very repetitive chorus in it and it's one of those um, songs that for some reason just gets stuck in my head and the chorus especially just over and over and over and over and one of the Days not too long ago, I had some, some rough news. Um, and as I was thinking and praying about the, the days ahead and how that was going to look, God just stuck that chorus in my head. It says, hallelujah, our God reigns. And it just kept, like, repeating over and over. And you're gonna, we're going to get to it, and you're going to know it. Um, and it just kind of cleared out all those cobwebs, all those fears, all those, like, doubts. And it just put my mind at peace and rest to just know, hallelujah, it means praise be to God, our God reigns. So we're going to sing this next song together. It might be a little newer to some of you, but um, it'll stick with you, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> God, I look to you, you're where my heart 
for right now together. It's one of those um, older hymns, but I'm sure it's familiar to many of you, called He Leadeth Me. (laughs) And um, one of the things that I found really interesting about this hymn, first of all, it's my favorite one ever, (laughs) Um, but it just, it flowed really well with tonight, so that's one of the reasons we we chose it for tonight. Um, But it was written to reflect the 23rd Psalm. And each of the verses, as you, as you sing them, as you listen to them, you can hear how it, it parallels the 23rd Psalm. And um, one of the things about the 23rd Psalm, um, if you're like me, we, we hear it a lot at funerals, and it's one of those passages that brings great comfort, and so it's one of those ones that you go to through really hard times sometimes, right? Um, but it's not really a passage about death. It's a passage about life and how our theme tonight, he's leading us. And I think that's what the, the lyricist of this wanted to invoke, was just how God takes us and leads us through the good times, the bad times. He is with us at all times. And so let's sing this next song together and just pay attention to those parallels. They're there, and they're really cool. Thank you. 
Person, but tonight I stand before you very vulnerable. The events I share are sacred with me. Only one person knows the extent of each event, and while they're only snippets of what I will share with you, the Lord has asked me to share these thoughts with you tonight. I have always had a sensitive heart for the things of God. I was three and a half years old when I first asked my mother if I could go to the altar when the invitation was given. She said I didn't know what it was all about. I told her I wanted to give my heart to Jesus. She nodded her head. I renewed my commitment many times as a child. At age 11, I made the commitment that has lasted a lifetime. That was the beginning of a habit that has served me well time and time again. I knew I would try to seek God's guidance in all things and follow wherever he would lead me. I attended a private Christian high school and soon learned, though it may sound crazy, that it was harder to live a Christian life in that atmosphere than it was in a public school. Everyone was assumed to be a Christian when in fact, not everyone was. It was there that I learned that not all Christians were actually living a Christian life. I wanted no part of that. As a high school sophomore, I thought I knew who I was going to marry, even to the point of pinpointing the date it would occur. <laughs> this guy and I were good friends, but nothing more. So very frustrated, one Sunday evening during my junior year, I went to the altar to pray about it. His initials were H-L-B, and I remember distinctly the Lord telling me, I have things all worked out for H-L-B and you. God told me nothing else. However, confident in God's all-knowing power, I left the altar relieved. Imagine my heartbreak years later when he told me that he had met the girl he was going to marry and was sure that I would like her because she was a lot like me. And their wedding date? Yes, it was one day earlier than the date I had planned on getting married. I wondered why God would tell me that he had things worked out for H, L, B, and me when he clearly hadn't, but I moved on. My decision as to where I would attend college depended on the programs the school offered. 
a Christian college in Illinois had a missionary training program. And as a high school junior, I made a commitment to be a missionary among Hispanic people. My application was accepted. However, the Lord rearranged my plans and firmly told me to attend the college in my hometown. I believed at the time the Lord wanted me to be there for my mother, as my father was a traveling evangelist and away from home months at a time. I obeyed the Lord's leading, and my declared major, major became Latin American Studies. As a college sophomore, I accepted the invitation to be the youth leader at an East Los Angeles inner city Spanish-speaking church. This was an extremely happy and productive time in my life. I loved the kids, some close to my age, and had a great rapport with their families and the church people. I played the piano for the English-speaking service, taught the high school Sunday school class, and directed youth activities. The church sponsored a Christian day school for kindergarten through eighth grade, and I had my heart on set on returning to that school as a teacher someday. Completing my sophomore year, I sensed the Lord telling me to transfer to the Illinois college that I had wanted to attend. I resisted for a time, being very content and happy where I was studying and working. I was the pianist for the college Spanish singing quartet, traveling with them to Hispanic churches in Southern California and to the Mexican border. I did not want to give that up. I had also fallen in love with the Hispanic teens, and they were like an extended family to me. I had difficulty comprehending them, leaving them while they were still in high school. It was with tears and a heavy heart that I obeyed the Lord and told the English pastor that I would not be available after the end of the summer. I knew that I would obey and follow God's leading, but it was hard work to walk away from the warmth and love of the Hispanic community. Fortunately, the pastor understood and gave me his blessing. At age 19 and a half, I moved to Illinois. Transitioning and discovering my place in the new setting was awkward. I was never homesick for California, but living in a rural environment was a huge adjustment. The college no longer offered the program I had intended to pursue, leaving me to select a different major. With the knowledge and desire to return and teach at the Spanish Christian Day School, I registered for the elementary education teaching program with minors in Spanish, history, and religion. This seemed like a good way to get my education and return to the community that I loved serving. Having had four years of Spanish in high school and another three years in college, and Spanish being spoken in my home church and community, I should have been fluent in the language. But being a perfectionist by nature, I did not want to make a mistake. I refused to speak in Spanish without a written script in hand. Traveling with the quartet, my testimony was always written out correctly for me to read. Years later, I came to realize that one only learns to speak the language by trying and making mistakes. To this day, I regret my stubbornness for not embracing the language. I corresponded with Free Methodist World Missions my entire college career. The personnel knew the changes in my life and my education. Preparing for graduation, I contacted them requesting permission to be assigned to the East Los Angeles Light and Life Christian Day School. Unfortunately, their answer was no. That answer was devastating to me. I learned to my dismay that a new policy was in place and no longer candidates could be assigned to their home location. Becoming a teacher there was now a closed door and there were so many closed doors. I did not get to marry the guy I had wanted, and I had given up my wonderful time as youth leader in Los Angeles, only to find out I could not return. I questioned God, asking him why he brought me to the Midwest to study for my career, 
and not allow me to the place I was so convinced he had called me to. Instead, the Lord provided a teaching position for me right where I was in Illinois, even in the middle of an academic year. Thankful for a job, I quit asking why, and instead asked, what do you have next for me since the door to Los Angeles is closed? The two and a half years teaching in an elementary school in Illinois changed the direction of my life. I met my future husband during summer school. We dated daily during the summer session. The remainder of the summer, he was in New York, and I was in Los Angeles, and we corresponded via snail mail. <laughs> Returning to campus in September, we continued dating. Many months later, I learned he had told his mother when he left for school that he was breaking up with me. But by that time, we were engaged, so apparently there had been a change of heart. <laughs> I had always said I would only date Christian guys. We both had a free Methodist heritage from our paternal sides. But I knew he was not a Christian in the same sense that I was a Christian. However, to my great surprise, God assured me it was okay to go ahead and date him. That fall, we attended a Billy Graham Film Festival in St. Louis, Missouri, where he accepted Christ. This changed my entire perspective, and we discussed marriage. My priority question was, will we minister together in, minister together in the church, or will I be on my own? My assumption always was that I would marry a minister, and my soon-to-be husband planned to work in the retail home building products. Searching for God's guidance, the Lord reminded me of my high school prayer and his answer. Again, God distinctly told me, remember, I told you I have all things worked out for H, L, B, and U. Then I realized, Six years after my initial prayer, God answered it. For HLB were the exact initials of the first boy I had wanted to marry all those years ago, and of Howard Lee Barnes, my soon-to-be fiancé. Convinced we would do ministry together, I accepted Howard's marriage proposal. After many twists and turns, I had met the HLB that was meant for me, and I marveled at God's wisdom and provision. Eight months after we were married, Howard received an opportunity to teach at his high school alma mater. His college degree was in business, but their need was for someone in athletics, an area in which he had excelled. I had already signed a contract for teaching in Illinois. I begged the Lord to give us one more year before we moved so I could sing in the Messiah Community concert that year. God does mysterious things, and once again, he provided. The superintendent of schools would not let me out of my contract, but he hired my husband on a provisional contract to fill a vacancy in the same district and at the same school where I was under contract. I sang the Messiah, and Howard and I celebrated a wonderful Christmas. A big challenge in my decision to marry Howard was knowing that Howard was from a very small town in the northeast part of the country and that I was at heart an L.A. girl. I wondered if I could be happy in such a place. The Lord and I had many discussions about this. God made it extremely clear that Narrowsburg and Beach Lake were to be my mission field. This is where he wanted to plant me. Looking back, I think he prepared me for the move to Narrowsburg through my time in rural Illinois, and once again, I obeyed and followed his leading. Howard and I have three birth daughters. As they grew, we wanted them to experience cross-cultural relationships. We answered an advertisement in the Fresh Air Fund to be parents for two weeks during the summer for children from inner city New York. For three summers, we hosted several different African-American girls. But the fourth year, the Lord brought a Shanae 
who then came to share our home and love yearly until she aged out of the program. The Free Methodist Church in Brooklyn, New York requested families and rural churches of the conference to consider inviting children from their inner city church to spend two weeks in the country. After much prayer, we invited Maritza and Maria, two Hispanic sisters. We grew to love our three extra daughters and our six girls became best friends. Reaching the teenage years, family dynamics changed. Shanae and Maritza remained a part of our family and the Lord added a local son, Stephen. We were now responsible for six children. Our obedience to open our home for non-biological children created conflict with relatives who disagreed with our decision. When each teen turned 18, each wanted us to be their permanent parents. Most people thought we were crazy. We also wondered what we were getting into ourselves. Following the Lord is not always the easiest thing to do. Despite differing opinions, as the Lord opened doors of opportunity, we stepped through. Once again, the Lord showed Howard and me his plan for our life. It was crazy and chaotic at times, but it was also rewarding and good for our family. In my early 50s, things erupted in my body and mind, and only a few select people knew what was going on. I resigned from many positions in the church and the community. It took every ounce of strength to come to church on Sunday morning and play the organ. I would go home afterwards and be totally exhausted. That was the beginning of a very long, nearly 20-year season of darkness. I knew the Lord was in charge, but suddenly life had become inexplicably and alarmingly difficult. I was diagnosed with clinical depression inherited from my paternal side of the family. I felt that life was over as I knew it. I figured that my usefulness was over as far as teaching was concerned. I never knew when panic would rear its ugly head and if I would be able to cope. I could not be around for people for any length of time. I got agitated and wanted to be left alone. I tried to function in what I thought was a normal way, but eventually even I realized that it was not normal and people were beginning to notice the difference. The Lord and I had many conversations regarding the condition of my body and mind. It took nearly 10 years before the sy symptoms subsided somewhat. During the healing process, little by little, the Lord restored the teaching role removed the music role, and added administrative roles. Without the leadership of the Lord in my life, I would never have been able to handle any of the restored areas. Each came to be after much prayer and deliberation. Because I knew my limitations, and I was not going to try to take on more than the Lord would give me the strength to handle. My complete and total healing occurred three years ago. I simply marvel at how the Lord has used that time in my life to enable me to walk alongside other women experiencing similar situations. I would never understood what they went through and were experiencing if I had not experienced it myself. That was a time of deeper growth spiritually, emotionally, and mentally. Insight was developed that would never have occurred otherwise. My pain was used in a beautiful way as I could walk beside and re relate to others experiencing depression, and that has been both an honor and a blessing. In closing, at the age of 16, I received a much desired red Bible for a Christmas gift. The Bible was my constant companion for many years until it became the print came too small for me to read. Only recently, after cataract surgery, much to my delight, 
I discovered that I could once again read my favorite Bible. As I perused the many notations made in the Bible during the 1960s, it was comforting to realize that the Lord had kept me focused on the important things in life. My testimony, I believe, has been one of obedience, even when I didn't understand his choices for my life. I had decided as a young girl to ask Jesus into my heart and to follow him wherever he would lead me. He has been faithful, and I pray that I have been just as faithful in return. My favorite scripture, my favorite hymn, my motto, my theme, my aim, and my prayer are the same today as they were when I was 16. My favorite scripture is Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. My favorite hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. My motto, I will serve my own generation by the will of God. My theme, Christ constantly in command, Christ completely in control. My aim, give a positive testimony. God has put you where you are because he wants a witness right there. And my prayer, let me burn out for thee, O God. Burn and wear out for thee. Don't let me rust or my life be a failure, my God, to thee. Use me and all I have, dear Lord, and get me so close to thee that I feel the throb of the great heart of God until I burn out for thee. I think as Cindy Sue just shared that following Jesus is not always the easiest thing and um, <clears throat> just because we have put our faith in Christ it doesn't mean all the paths are going to be clear and perfect, right? Um, there's a process that we go through where God is consistently molding us and working us into his perfect, beautiful creation. And the next song we're going to sing is called Refiner's Fire. And if you're familiar with, with what fire does to precious metals, it melts it down. And so you can take those impurities right off and then it can be created into something perfect. And that's what God does with each one of us when we've come to faith in him and we put our trust in him. He consistently puts us through those fires to mold us and to masterfully create us into something pure so that we can face a holy God. So let's sing this next song together. If you would stand if you're able again.
more comfortable up here doing skits for v VBS, <laughs> but, um, but I felt like this was very important to share. So I grew up Catholic with the Catholic faith. The structure of Catholicism was the only way I knew as to how to relate to God. I was told to say my prayers, to be good, to go to confession if I messed up, and after, I don't know, maybe 10 Hail, Hail Marys, three glory to God, to our Father, uh, prayers, all would be forgiven. Do. Be. It was through this lens that I saw myself. In order for God to love me, I had to fulfill the, these criteria. I was to go through catechism, Holy Communion classes, and work my way through. The emphasis on not being good enough stuck with me for a long time. It was with this script in mind that I related to others in the world as well. In order for me to be accepted, I made sure to act certain ways, um, whether that acceptance was from my mom and dad or from my friends at school. My identity came from pleasing others. I didn't realize at the time that my true identity would come from having a real relationship with Jesus Christ. Fast forward to junior high school a difficult time in any young person's life to begin with. Our family was struck by tragedy when my sister's life was taken. It was a devastating and life-changing event. I saw the people that I loved hurting, and I decided that I wouldn't or couldn't add to that by crying in front of anybody, even though I was hurting so much too. I thought that if I cried, it would make my mom cry harder and I had already watched my dad's tears silently fall. At such a tender young age, I decided on my own that I had to be strong for them. In my mind, I had to be good, behave well through this crisis to make it easier on those I love. In retrospect, this was not something that my parents expected of me. In fact, they began to worry at my lack of showing emotion. This strong wall of defense took a toll on my physical health in the long run. It was not a healthy way to handle my grief. I didn't understand that I didn't have to do this alone. And because my family was reeling from the great loss of my sister's, at my sister's death, I took a very hard road basically on my own. This was a time when some would wonder why I wasn't mad at God. I could have been, and I'm sure I had my moments, but instead, I talked to God frequently through all of this. I remember spending a lot of time in the woods, hiking, talking to God, and crying alone where nobody could see me. I somehow never got really mad at God. He was always there, but even then, at age 13, I desired more of a relationship with him, especially then. I didn't understand his ways, though. Why did my sister have to die? It was a lot to handle. Eventually, my family moved to this area. 
and we to start over and to try to heal. Fast forward again, many years through high school and early 20s. I attended church occasionally and was still walking through life finding my identity through the eyes of those around me. I got married and tried to succeed in that marriage by being good, holding in my feelings, and not making any waves. To say the least, it was a rocky road. I began going to church more frequently, just reaching out to God um, through the comfort and the traditions and the rhythm of the Catholic faith. I felt like I was missing something, though, even then. My marriage ended in a messy divorce. I tried so hard to be the perfect wife and do everything just right. And it just wasn't enough. I wasn't enough to keep us together. Well, there's so much more to that story. This is just a peek into my heart at that time, my mindset. I hurt. I hurt really badly. One day, I was at the depths of my despair. I sat on the floor next to my bed, and I cried, all out, ugly cried. I was at such a low point in my life, I, <laughs> a place that I never want to revisit. I remember thinking, just never enough. I try so hard to please, and still I get rejected by the one that said he was going to, he vowed that he was going to love me forever. I remember crying out loud, who's going to love me now? There happened to be a crucifix on the wall facing me. And when I looked up at that moment, I heard in my head so clearly, I will. I really don't remember what happened next. Um, but I eventually picked myself up, the, up off the floor, and I tried to find the Bible that I kept somewhere in the house. I read Psalm 23 because I knew it. It's one of the few I knew. I read, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Little did I know, little did I even understand at that time that Jesus was already walking with me through this dark valley in my life. Shortly after that, I was working a part-time job where I met a young woman who happened to tell me about her church and how they would engage others by um, going out and giving gas cards um, and gallons of milk on every fifth Sunday and maybe be able to strike up a conversation uh, about the gospel. I was intrigued, and she invited me to church. Looking back now, it seems that God was preparing to answer my prayers. That was in 2012, and it was Vaughn and Paul Pack Free Methodist Church. I began to gradually go to some Bible studies and found my thirst for a relationship with Jesus just growing more and more. For the first time, I was actually reading my Bible and really getting into the Word, getting to know Jesus. I began to discover the one who would truly love me for me, even if I wasn't perfect, even if I didn't always behave pleasantly or made the wrong choice or messed up. I'm still not enough, but I learned that Jesus was the one I really needed to rely on for my identity, not people. Jesus is the one to put my faith and trust in. And what is really neat is that I could go to talk and talk to him directly anytime I wanted. I didn't have to go through a priest. <laughs> <laughs> I can confess my sin directly to Jesus. My view was changing, and so was my confidence and my sense of worth as I finally was able to see myself as a child of God. I started to find that joy and peace that I had been searching for for so long. In 2014, I met my husband. Unlike before, this time I could see that God had a very clear hand in our relationship. In order for us to find each other, God took Bill on a mission trip to Haiti. But I wasn't on that trip. 
he went with a group from here, Beach Lake, and they joined with a group from Wall and Popeye Church and Pastor Ken Platt. It wasn't until they were home that one of the women from Wall and Pawpack introduced me to Bill. In 2015, we went kayaking with, Ke with uh, Pastor Ken Platt, and he married us on the Delaware River. <laughs> and about two weeks later, we both got baptized together in the Delaware by Pastor Scott Broad. We placed God first and each other second. With God in the equation, our marriage is strong. So here I stand before you, a child of God with a much clearer perspective on what love is and who I am. I was close to broken, but the Lord was faithful. He has given me a new identity, one that provides hope no matter our earthly circumstances. A God and a husband that love me for me. I mentioned earlier that was, I was walking a long, hard road as a young girl on my own. Now I'm safe and have nothing to fear, just as when I, too, was a little girl, dancing on my daddy's shoes and looking up into his loving eyes. I now know that I am never alone and never will be again. Jesus is always faithful and always present in my life. Lastly, I just want to share my life verse with you. It's Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. I've learned to submit and su surrender my life to Jesus on a daily basis. Some days, a minute to minute basis. But knowing he is in control and I am his helps me to not always try to understand the hard things the difficult or even traumatic things in life. I lean on him. I trust in him. We have one more song <clears throat> to sing together tonight. The program is not over, but uh, we're going to be singing this next song, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. And the theme that I think has been pretty obvious for at least the two that we've heard so far, and I know for the third testimony we're going to hear, is that, um, as Cindy Sue's verse says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. We cannot stand on our own two feet and expect to, to win, but through Christ and his strength and trusting in him, we can do all things. So let's stand again, if you're able, to sing this song together. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Joy, my righteousness and free. 
My name is Vanessa Lancelotti, and I'd like to thank you for allowing me to share a little piece of my heart. I hope that you're able to see a piece of my father's heart as well as I share. So as some of you may already know, I was actually, um, Beach Lake Green Methodist Church was one of my home churches through middle school and high school. While far from perfect, I was raised in a Christian family where I was taught the principles of God and attended several youth camps, retreats, and summer programs. While I was given a strong foundation in biblical principles, it wasn't really until my freshman year in college that I decided I wanted to completely commit my life to the Lord, and so I wanted to get baptized. It was actually here at this church that I was baptized in fall of 2011 after I um, had gotten back from waitressing down the road at the country uh, cafe. <laughs> I jumped in the pool. Um, <laughs> there had been so many seeds planted here with amazing Christian leaders and mentors, and I remember making the decision that I wanted to give my life to the Lord, and I officially wanted to turn over a new leaf. There was a sense of freedom that I had as I rededicated my life to the Lord, along with a deep conviction of my sin, and what seemed to be an unquenchable thirst for the Word of God. I purchased a new Bible in a translation I was able to read, <laughs> rather than the old King James, which is great. I just wasn't able to understand it. Um, so I purchased a new Bible in a translation I was able to read, which brought my level uh, with the Lord to a different height and I was on fire for God and I wanted to serve him in every way possible and I tried to share Jesus in every way I could at my college campus in the college gym in the dorms on Facebook um, and at one point I even considered transferring to Bible college so that I could learn the word and then teach it myself 
And while I believed I was genuinely saved and born again, I had still some very uh, deep and personal um, wounds that needed to be healed. And I had some deep brokenness and depression that I needed to be released from. I soon fell back into some old mindsets and old patterns with feelings of condemnation and guilt. While it was not true, I continually felt like I was letting God down with my behavior and my performance. The more I believed these lies, the worse it became. I battled with perfectionism towards myself and how I thought that God saw me. Rather than living a life in freedom and grace, I entered into a performance-based mentality that only led to deeper frustration and distance away from God. I became consumed with my own sin and my own mistakes and regrets. There were even times I seriously questioned my own salvation and my identity in Christ. My husband James and I met in Christian fellowship on, at the university on campus where um, he became a Christian through the fellowship by all of his buddies on the college football team. We were in several classes together and took a liking to one another and in a year and a half we were married in the church that we were attending. Following graduation, we moved closer to family and obtained our first entry level job positions. We became several, we, became, we began serving in a local church where one morning I was asked during Sunday school, what are your spiritual gifts? And I fumbled and bumbled around with an answer and came up with something that maybe sounded okay, but truly I had absolutely no idea. <laughs> Following service, I went home and I wept to my husband saying, I don't know if I have any spiritual gifts at all. <laughs> I don't know who I am or what I'm supposed to do. I feel just completely lost. I went from renewing my life to Christ as a freshman in college to feeling completely just sold out to him, um, to feeling completely lost and beyond repair. I remember cry crying out to him as I dro drove home from work one day, God, where are you? I can't see you. All throughout the New Testament, I would read about the many miracles and healings that Jesus would perform, but I wondered why I wasn't seeing them in my own life. In the prison of my own mind, I believed that I had fallen too far from being qualified to serve in God's house. I believed that James was called to serve in his house, but I was dying inside. It was the evening before Super Bowl 2016 when I suffered a traumatic brain hemorrhage that changed my life forever. My two sisters and I were enjoying some hot tea together when all of a sudden I experienced shooting sharp pain in the back of my head that brought me down onto the ground crying in agony. I clutched my head trying and, and tightly and cried out, ow, my head, my head. As I attempted to open my eyes, I could barely see. I instantly knew something was seriously wrong and that I needed immediate medical attention. Thankfully, my sister Melissa is a certified radiology technician and tried ruling out any potential terminal conditions while my other sister, Amanda, quickly helped me run to the car. We raced to the nearest hospital while Melissa stayed home to care for my little nephew who was home fast asleep. She immediately began calling friends, family, church members, and the 700 Club for prayer. I remember so vividly how much pain and fear I felt as Amanda and I rushed to the Evangelical Hospital emergency room. I knew that my body was shutting down. I knew that I was dying. Rather than praying for healing, I began praying and preparing myself to meet the Lord. I believed that it was my last night and that I was going to meet Jesus. As I continued vomiting from all of the pain and pressure in my brain, 
my mind started racing through anything in my mind that I could think of to repent of. We finally arrived to the emergency room after what seemed like an eternity. It was difficult for me to see, so Amanda practically carried me to the front desk. The receptionist continued to ask me my name and identification information, but all I could say was, I don't know, I don't know. I was in so much pain that I couldn't think straight. Soon I was rece receiving a thorough CT scan that indicated I was suffering from a severe brain hemorrhage and immediately needed to see, be seen by a trauma center. By that time, my husband arrived to the scene. We had only been married less than two years as a 22 and 23 year old. When he was being asked many questions and to give documentation that laid out all of the risks for upcoming procedures and he was also asked if he had a will in case something were to happen to me that evening and I, weren't, I wasn't going to make it through or make it through surgery. We were both packed into the ambulance en route to the Geisinger Hospital when I would undergo extensive trauma care. I remember so clearly how much pain I was in. From the piercing sirens, bright lights, and EMTs, I was in the height of my pain when suddenly all of the lights, noises, and surrounding chaos went completely silent and I was in no more pain at all. Everything around me went completely white and I was in the Lord's presence. All I could say, all I could feel was the love and perfect peace of the Lord. I felt as though I were a little girl with no recollection of any physical or emotional pain. There was no acknowledgement of anything wrong in the world, no painful memories, or no, no more fears. I was in total and utter peace, peace that could never be described through human words. As I stood in his presence, I remember Jesus hugging me as he said loud and clear, it is not yet your time. While it wasn't long enough, while it was not a long encounter, I clearly remember his hand leaving mine as I returned back into the hospital, surrounded by my family and friends. All I could say to them was, I saw Jesus, I saw Jesus. He hugged me, he loves me, he saved me, and he's coming back again. It was difficult for me to communicate much else at that point, but the entire time I was in the hospital, from admittance to discharge, I continually shared about the loving encounter that I had with Jesus. With God's incredible grace and the caring prayers and support from my pastors and loved ones, I was out of the hospital following my craniotomy after less than one week. It's amazing. This began the transformational recovery and restoration journey. Yet, I seemed to be exceeding doctors' expectations. For several months, and even up to one year following recovery, it was extremely difficult for me to read, write, or fully process and articulate my thoughts. I struggled with short-term memory and following through with simple tasks and instructions. The ruptured brain bleed was caused by what doctors would call an arterial venous malformation of the brain. It's essentially a birth defect that consists of an unusual cluster of veins and vessels in the brain or spinal cord that can, be ca that can cause detrimental brain damage if undiagnosed and untreated. While I would complain of headaches from time to time, I had no idea that I had an AVM. Originally, I was told by doctors that I might not ever be able to see or drive ever again. This news was completely devastating to me as I had no idea what my life would look like from here. However, in just six to seven months, I was cleared to start driving again. It was in these quiet moments of pain and suffering 
that I actually experienced the deepest intimacy, healing, and deliverance. While God had been healing me physically, starting off with a supernatural miracle, he was healing me on the inside and shaping my identity in him. Even though I had an incredible life-changing encounter with the great physical, the great physician himself, it was a traumatic near-death experience, nonetheless, that resulted in critical trials to overcome. The, few, the, first few following, the, few, the first few months following surgery, I battled legitimate PTSD. At first, I would dream of Jesus in the sun, surrounding me with his light and love. But soon, I would wake up in the middle of the night in an utter panic and fear. I'd wake up with shaking and cold sweats. As I was embarking on a, my, a wildly renewed adventure with Christ, I was entering into a heavy spiritual battle. One evening, I awoke in panic, filled with fear and dread. But, at the, but as I desperately called out to Jesus, I soon heard the clear and audible voice of God say to me, do not give up. Just those few simple words from God were enough to keep me fighting. I began educating myself on spiritual warfare, the spiritual gifts, and the manifestations of the Holy Spirit to equip me in power and authority against the enemy. At the same time, my mom, sisters, and husband would help take me to my medical appointments. I began learning more about God's intentions for healing, to heal us in all areas of our life. As found in Luke 4, 18 through 19, which reads, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Yet again, one evening, I experienced what some might describe as an open vision. It was a vision of a human heart suspended in front of mine and James's bedroom. Not a paper heart or an emoji heart, but an actual human heart with chambers and blood vessels. Audibly, I heard the Lord say to me, you keep focusing on your brain, but I am healing your heart. What could this have possibly meant? Completely awed and amazed, I still awoke slightly baffled. The Lord was going to heal and transform my spiritual heart and perform a healing from the inside out, just as in Luke 4, 18 through 19. What an amazing God that we serve. Just following the vision and word from the Lord about healing my broken heart, my family and and my family and I started attending a church that incorpor incorporated a lot of inner healing and counseling. There he began healing my emotions and bringing, me, bringing to memory any unresolved childhood and young adult traumas and wounds. I was being mentored by a woman who began teaching me how to better discern the voice of God from the voice of the enemy. Called by the Lord to minister Luke 4, 18 through 19, she began teaching me how to recognize lies that the enemy had spoken over me that I came into agreement with and how to replace them with God's truth in his word. Oftentimes she would simply listen and validate my pain, which brought a lot of healing all by itself. Before long, my personal relationship with God continued to grow stronger and stronger as I healed deeper and deeper. In less than a year, James and I moved to Virginia Beach to pursue employment and continued education at Regent University. I continued to follow up on my medical appointments and also enrolled in some counseling as well. There, I was introduced to so many amazing classmates, pastors, and professors that had such a zeal for the Lord. 
In our first year living in Virginia, I was invited by Chancellor Pat Robertson to speak at his house for a student welcoming event and later aired on the 700 Club after one of my pastors informed them of my story. I continued to learn more about the character and nature of God and his desire to heal us. While I would never wish this on anyone ever, it was through my brokenness and recovery that God showed himself to me in far more intimate ways than could have other, otherwise been possible. It was only about a year ago that another major shift took place in my life. During my quiet time with him at the kitchen table, he revealed to me so clearly that while it was indeed Jesus who saved me there in the ambulance that night, he reminded me of John 14, 9 that reads this. He who has seen me has seen the Father. It has been through this transformational healing process of walking on his shoes in close discipleship that he has been washing me clean and cleansing me from all my sin and unrighteousness and showing me more of himself. It has been through this process that he's taken my broken heart and imparted his own so that I might reflect more of his son. In the story of the prodigal son, or otherwise known as the loving father, the younger of the two sons gained an inheritance in his father's kingdom, but then goes off into a foreign land where he squanders his inheritance in a series of poor choices. He finds himself in an impoverished and lowly condition as he came to the end of himself. When he started coming to his senses, that he realized he had all that he needed in his father's house, he began his journey back home. But the loving father met him along the way and embraced him. The younger son no longer felt worthy or to be called his father's son. But the father welcomed him back in with a robe, a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, and a feast. It was in the father's house that he was cleaned up and restored back to his original position. Much like, this, my, much like the story of the loving father, I was dead but came back to life. I was lost but I was found. And he said to him, son, you have always, you have always been with me and all that is mine is yours. But he had, but we have to celebrate and rejoice. For this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost but is now found. Luke 15, 31 through 32. A few years ago, I didn't even know my ABCs or have the ability to even read Go Dog Go to my three-year-old nephew. I couldn't drive or even remember my own address or phone number to make a phone call. This year, I'll be graduating with my master's degree from Regent University and a uh, certification from the International Board of Christian Care as a Master Christian Life Coach. I can stand here in front of you tonight to testify of God's miraculous power and tender love and care for his children. In just four years, he saved me from death and potential vegetative state completely healing me of debilitating endometriosis, and he has restored my identity in him. Today, one of my missions is to minister to the lost in the prodigal population, to be restored to the Father and return back home. Perhaps you or someone you know was once walking closely with the Lord, but has fallen away. Perhaps there are even in church every Sunday, but their hearts are far from God. I just want to encourage you that if and when you come back to him, that his response is not one of, <laughs> he loves you. Um, <laughs> his response is not one of disappointment, but one of celebration over you. There's freedom and healing and restoration in Christ 
through the cross, and I want to share with you the good news to turn back to him and turn back into the Father's house. Thank you so much for allowing me to share just a piece of my heart with you and a piece of the Father's heart. And my prayer is that each of you are able to experience a life-changing encounter with him too that revitalizes your soul and transforms your heart to look more like his.